I'm going to I'm going to start you off here with a uh, a verse in First John chapter number three, and I, and maybe and I don't want to, I don't mean this condescendingly at all, please, but I want to explain uh, the word that I'm going to use that I think John presents us with in this verse, and it's a word that I I don't know if there's a better one. Maybe there is. Maybe there's a better synonym. But this one, you know, it's not one you hear all the time, so I just want to make sure that we're all clear on this. And the word is, the word in English is juxtaposition. Not just a position, but juxtaposition. And, and for, for those that don't use it often enough to, to, you know, just kind of keep it in the forefront of our brains, juxtaposition is, is a, uh, it's kind of a literary presentation it's a presentation of two things side by side in the same, in the same context, and yet they are op- seemingly opposed to one another. So you have, so the writer that, that uses that has juxtaposed this, this subject, uh, this context, and challenges the reader to understand it for what it is. Does that make any sense? Maybe I just made it worse. I should have just said juxtaposition and gone on. But anyway, chapter number three of First John, and, and and by the way, I you know I would expect the Apostle Paul, you know, to to use this literary technique, if you will. I'm not meaning that they're manipulating the Word of God, but he writes with such eloquence and uh, depth that automatically, you know, if I said, you know, who's the great, you know, who's the great master of juxtaposition in the Scriptures, or you know, in the New Testament, one would I think say the Apostle Paul by the pure volume of what he said and how he presents it. But here it is, John, uh, the Apostle John, and he's not exactly the one that I would think that does this, but it's, but it's marvelous how God moved him to say this, this position in God, this position as Christians living in this present world. It's, it's phenomenal. Listen to this. Oh, let me read verse 1, and then verse 2 is the one that I want to focus on. And he says, Behold... What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And that, that's huge in itself. I mean, what kind of love can the Almighty God... I mean, what, what amount of love is it when the Almighty of Almighties would call us the sons of God? I told the leaders yesterday, you know, I, about when you consider the vastness of God that... That all of this great universe that we, you know, we, we look out in the sky at night on a clear night and, and a dark night and we see stars that seemingly go on forever. And to uh, the human, in the human way of looking at things, they do go on forever. And yet the Bible tells us that all of this is contained in God. In Him we live and move and have our being. So it's not, I told them yesterday that, you know, it's not, God doesn't have to flit from one side of the universe to the other to take care of things. All this is happening by his hand within who he is. It's, it's just, it boggles the human, the human mind for sure. And yet, that same God who became flesh, mind-blowing again, also told his disciples in John 15 that from that point on, he wasn't look, going to look at them or, or call them servants anymore, but he would start calling them friends. There's a, there was a somewhat modern chorus that says that we, I am the friend of God. That's huge. So what manner of love is it that Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God? Therefore, the world knows us not because they don't know Him. Because it knew Him not. Verse number two. Beloved, and here's the juxtaposition. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Now are we the sons of God. And we sing songs like, He has done great things. Bless His holy name. And the reality of the Christian life also means that we'll leave here and we'll run into something in the next day or two or week or month or whatever it is that is a crisis. It's a crisis in nature. It's, it's, it's a trial. It's, it's an affliction. It's a difficulty. It's a challenge. It's, it's a terrible time. It's more, it's burdensome. It's, it's, it weighs you down. And, in, and we can sing with victory and assurance 
on one hand that he has done great things and that he will do great things and yet we leave here and we hit the glass wall out there that just seems to stop us in our tracks. And we have to be reminded all over again that he can do anything. He can do anything except stuff that's not God. He can't lie. He can't die. He can't change. He can't deny himself. We studied that a little bit over the weekend. You know, if we deny him, he'll deny us. But he can't deny himself. The reason that he can't, he can't do something against a human will and save somebody who doesn't open his heart so that God can change everything for his eternity, the reason that he can't force himself on them is because that's not who he is. And he's looking for people that will surrender to him. Just simply put, that will simply surrender to God. I mean, how hard is that? And yet it's the hardest thing in the, in the human condition. For some reason, it's the hardest thing seemingly to do. When you finally do it, you realize it was the easiest and best thing you ever decided. But God cannot deny himself. He can't be something that he's not. He'll never say something that he is not. He'll never use a name that is not apt for him. That doesn't somehow talk about his will and project his personality. So here's the juxtaposition. Now are we the sons of God. We're the sons of God. We know our Father. We know Him. And yet, it doesn't yet appear what we shall be. We're the sons of God, but it doesn't yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we know that we shall be like Him because we know that we shall see Him as He is. Then. We'll see Him as He is then. Now we're the sons of God. But it doesn't yet appear what we shall be. Because we haven't fully seen Him as He is. The best thing we can do is read, read His Word. And pray and reflect on and contemplate the word and nature of God over and over and discuss it with ourselves and with our family and with our friends and in the church and preach it and teach it everywhere that we go. But it does not yet appear what we shall be. We haven't quite seen him as he is, but we shall. The juxtaposition is we are the sons of God. We know who we are. We have an identity in Christ. You begin to find you'll never know who you are, by the way, until you know who God is. There's no way, there's no way you can figure yourself out in this life without knowing, first of all, who God is. There's got to be a baseline in everything. And it, there's got to be a baseline. There's got to be, a, there's gotta be a, a, a measuring stick, and God is the measuring stick. Who am I without knowing Him? I'm just lost in my imagination. But when I see who He is, and I see how He wants, how he wants to work and rule and reign and, and love me in this life, I begin to find out who I am in this life. I begin to get experience. I begin to walk with Him and fellowship with Him. And He, he uses me and He corrects me and He rebukes me and He, and he, he shows me what's next. I slog through a terrible, t terrible parts of my life and somehow I come through the other side. The Bible says that tribulation, Paul wrote that tribulation produces patience and patience produces experience and, patient, and experience produces hope. So as I go through these things and survive each one by the grace of God, then when I reach another one I can look back and say, I don't know how I made that one except by God. And I also know that I'll make it through this one. And even if I don't make it through this one, I know, I know who my Redeemer is. There's this, the, the whole Christian life is, is somehow, I mean, you can present it in juxtaposition. This is who, I mean, here we are together. I, I just, I, I, I mentioned this over the weekend to the, to the, in the leaders' uh, meetings that there is, there's, a, there's a corporate faith when we all get together. That's another thing about the hill. You know, there's a corporate faith that just kind of, uh, it just kind of self, it, it's kind of self-fuels 
the, the, the faith of, of Antioch, uh, the apostolic church, when we get together, you know, if, if, you're, if you're down a little bit, you can feel, you can feel the, the, the faith of somebody else in the body. We're not all, we're not all a bunch of islands out there. You know, a little bit, you know, a little bit of, uh, anyway, a little less, a little less COVID influence. And, and you, can, you, can just, you can just see it on the faces of people that, uh, you know, look at you and say, can I give you a hug? I hugged somebody yesterday and I said, man, isn't that great? And uh, he said, I've been waiting for this for a long time. Just a hug. I just need a hug. Because that's who we are. And that's what we do. And that's how we feel about one another. And it really is a, it is a godly family that we're talking about. There's a corporate faith here. And yet, you know, and yet when we leave here and go out like an island into life and, and do our thing in the business place or, or wherever, or the school or wherever we are, we run into these things and that corporate faith is not, not you know, right backing us up at the moment. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We don't see as clearly what's going to happen through all these, these times that we face. And this, you know, this last, you know, this last year plus now has been tough for lots of people all around the globe. You know, you can, you, you can tell me about your faith over COVID all you want to, but the reality is that in the human condition, it's been a pandemic that has been very, very hard to survive. I read about a, I mean, several months ago, I read about a 90, I think a 98-year-old woman that, that came through it. Oh, pretty good, you know, came through pre- amazingly. You know, you think she'd be a goner, you know, and she got through it. And you read about young people, strong and fit, on top of everything, and they, are, they succumb to this, to this uh, virus. Businesses shut down, people out of work, people losing their lives, people afflicted, some, some maybe permanently, at least in this life, by the ravages of this disease, loss of income, economic despair. Who knows what's going to happen in the, you know, the U.S. inflation and the U.S. debt and, you know, sending out thousands, zillions of dollars to the America. I mean, I, thanks, Uncle Sam, you know, but, you know, everybody's going to pay for this. It's just, it ravaged, you know, we haven't seen the end of it yet. I'm sure lots of countries are bankrupt around the world. I, things have just changed all around. It just meant, it's just tough. It's been hard. There's been a lot of loss. But we're the sons of God. But we feel the loss. As long as we're in this flesh, that's the way it's going to be. And we can know God more, and we can know Him, understand Him more deeply. And we should. We should grow in His grace and in the knowledge of Him. We spent a lot of time in Saturday, Friday and Saturday talking about being strong in the grace of the Lord. But there's also this thing that Peter tells us that should, we should you know, grow in grace and also in the knowledge of Jesus Christ the Lord. Knowing Him. And what about Jesus' own life on the earth? I mean, it's, it's a juxtaposition right there. Here's God Almighty in the flesh. When you've seen me, he told them, the unbelievers, you've seen the Father. Before Abraham was, he told the Jewish leaders, I am. Doesn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense to, didn't make any sense to, to uh, Simon Peter when, you know, when Jesus queries the disciples, you know, uh, who do men say that I am? Well, they, you know, there's a lot of talk that your Jeremiah has come back. And, you know, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say, other, you know, you're this prophet or that prophet. Okay, well, who do you say that I am? And, and brilliant Simon Peter who has, 
You know, he, he, this fisherman that has insight into the things of God, he had insight. He had God-given insight by his grace. He had, he had God-given insight. He could, he, could, he could see and he could label things for what they were. He was a practical man, I guess. But he could also miss some of the most, uh, you know, intricate parts of the puzzle. Simon Peter says, well, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. You're the real one. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And like four verses later, Jesus begins to tell them that now we're going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be arrested and, and they're, going to, they're going to treat me like a common criminal and find me guilty and then they'll crucify me. But on the third day I'll rise again and Peter takes him aside and begins, the Bible says in the King James, and begins to rebuke Jesus for what he just said. Juxtaposition. I see that you're the Christ. You're the anointed one. And yet I don't see any justification for what you just say, for what you just said about your human suffering. Doesn't make any sense to me. Doesn't make any sense to me. Doesn't make any sense to me. Sometimes suffering in this life doesn't make any sense to me, Jesus. I don't yet see what I shall be. But I know. And what you've got to fall back on is what you know. And I know that I'm one of the sons of God. John chapter number 20. Let me show you another example of this. John number 20. Chapter number 20. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into the details. It's it's a wonderful, just engaging. Excuse the expression around Antioch. It's a wonderful puzzle that that it, that it's our responsibility to have some understanding about the day of the resurrection. It's really interesting. It's interesting stuff, and putting all the pieces together in the right chronology. I mean, the chronological order is is interesting. But I'm, let's dispense with that and just go to John's version of this. Verse number one, the first day of the week comes Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, the grave, and sees the stone taken away. So she runs and comes to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, of course, and said unto them, we've taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they've laid him. I don't know what happened to him. There had to have been a prayer meeting somewhere. There had to be a teaching somewhere from somebody to her because the disciples knew what he had taught them. And he had taught them that on the third day I'll rise again. He had said publicly that if you destroy this temple in three days I'll raise it up and nobody got that either. Here he is, the Christ, the Son of the living God, the one that we've been looking for, the one that John the Baptist said would would change everything and now we've for, forgotten completely everything that was ever, ever intimated about the fact that he might, yes, he might be crucified, but he'll be in fact resurrected on the third day that's gone. So Peter goes, goes forth and the other disciple, and they came to the, to the sepulcher and they ran both together. And the other disciple outran Peter and came first to the sepulcher and he stooped down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying and yet he didn't go in. And then comes Simon Peter following, and he goes in and sees the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. And then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw, and then he believed. Believed what? Believed he wasn't there. That's what he believed. He believed he wasn't there. You're right. He's not there. I didn't believe that the stone was rolled away until we got here, but then I believed it. I didn't believe that, you know, he's not inside, but I finally got brave enough to go in there after Peter did. And you're right, I believe he's not there. Verse 9, for as yet they knew not the Scripture. For as yet they knew not the Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. They didn't know Psalm 1610. They didn't know Psalm 33. They didn't know John 16. They forgot about Mark 831. Then the disciples went away under their own home by because they didn't know what to do. 
They're the sons of God. They're they're future sons of God here. These are the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they don't know what to do. What a juxtaposition. Three years with Jesus. Ate with Him, slept with Him, walked with Him, suffered with Him. Ridiculed along His side of Him, and they really don't know what to do. But Mary, Mary stays back. They go away. She's come. She's gone back and got them. They ran. She must have walked really quickly because all of a sudden she's there again. And then they leave and now she's there. Mary stood outside of the sepulcher weeping, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeing two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, the angel said unto her, Woman, why are you weeping? Here's the human condition in just a few verses. Why are you weeping? Let me tell you something from personal experience, okay? You need to learn how to listen to God when He asks you a question. Because He's teaching you. He's not asking you because He doesn't know. Remember when he pray, prayed twice for the blind man? They brought, he was walking through a town. And they dragged a blind man off, you know, off the side of the road to him and said, you know, heal this guy. And he takes him out of town. He takes him away from the town square. Gets him out there and he prays for him one time. And then he asked the man, what do you see? Jesus knew exactly how he saw. Jesus is the one that healed him halfway. Did you, know, did you know Jesus can heal halfway? I wonder if Benny Hinn ever thought about that. And created a way that he would, instead of going like this, he could just go. You know, and. And the, and, the, and the guy, supposedly crippled in the wheelchair, could come out like this. <laughs> Jesus can heal. He can heal any fraction you name. He can help you out of a situation to the 98th degree or the, the second degree. 98th percentile, first percentile. There's been times when God has just simply given me a little bit of touch, a little nudge. And it was enough. He's he's given me a nudge before and expected me to do the rest in some situations. People start talking to me. You know, they used to talk to me of all these crazy things they got off the, you know, the the internet in the latter days where they got off of satellite television listening to all these dingbat preachers, all these televangelists that are good for absolutely nothing. They're a waste of, of oxygen. Just sowing lies wherever they go and beam themselves and getting their millions of dollars and not caring for the listeners and whatsoever except how big their wallets are, you know. And they beam all this this absolute rubbish around the world and, you know, hungry African pastors who, who somehow see it in a hotel or somebody sends them a CD of this crackpot, you know. They say, well, this guy's rich. This guy's successful. I, I, what I need to do, I, you know, I don't need to find out who I am in God. I don't need to find out what kind of a preacher he wants to make me in God. I'm not going to find out how he wants me to pa- how God wants me to pastor. I'll just copy these boneheads. I see it in our own midst. I see people learning how to preach, you know, by actions and voices. <gasps> And what in the world is that? Is there a class at Bible school that you get that? You've been out there. Do they teach that in school? But you hear it there, don't you? Where do they get that stuff? You know? These guys, so they learn this stuff off of the television or the satellite or the internet or whatever it is. 
And then they start acting like idiots. And they come up with these doctrines that they hear, and they start spreading them around the room and spreading them around the, the country and spreading them around the continent and, you know, speaking faith. Create, you know, you've got the creative power of, of faith, the, the power of the tongue. You've got the power of the tongue. You know, you've got God inside, and he's the creator, and he speaks things in, into existence. So they so just speak this stuff into existence. Go ahead, speak it all you want to. And if you're unfortunate enough that God gives you stupid things that you're speaking into existence, you're in big trouble. Because now you think it works. Now these magic formulas work. If you pray a certain way, and if you act a certain way, you know, and you copy somebody else, you know, then it's going to happen. Don't copy somebody else. Find out who you are and share it. They tell me about faith. They tell me about how great faith, you know, faith does all this stuff. I said, well, some things God just expects you to know for yourself. Oh, I don't have faith. We got to have faith. Well, I said, you know, and then I would say something st- stupid to them, but, you know, practical to me. Let me tell you something. If you walk down the middle of a railroad track long enough, you'll get killed. You can walk down that railroad track saying, I'm okay all you want to. And all of a sudden, around the bend comes the 515. <laughs> oh, ye of little faith. Why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? She's, and the angels aren't the only ones that ask her that. Woman, why are you weeping? She said unto them, because they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they put him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back, and she saw Jesus standing, but she didn't know who he was, because it was, it was like just before the dawn. It was dark. It's hard to see. She didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said unto her, woman, why are you weeping? Pay attention when God asks you a question. Like, why do you feel like this? Why are you acting like this? Why are you doing this? Why are you going here? What are you thinking about? How does this touch you? What does this say to you? Why are you crying? Why are you crying? And whom are you looking for? Whom do you seek? They came, you know, they came to arrest Jesus, and what is he? He, he asked them a question. This, this rabble rousing, this, this bunch of, these bunch of soldiers and the guys with their swords and staves and, and sticks and, and torches. And the, you know, they might have had a, it was like a lynch mob. It's going to be a lynching, you know, in, in, in Jerusalem. And he simply says, who are you looking for? Who are you looking for? Who are you looking for? Who are you? Who are you looking for? I know why you've come. You know, he could have said, I'm God. I know who you are. I know where you live. (laughs) Go ahead and arrest me. Go ahead and crucify me. But I know where you live. I know where you work. I know who your family is. I know how much is in the bank account. What I'm asking you is, who are you looking for? Because if you're looking for the, the Savior... You're seeing him, but you don't have a clue about who he is. It seems like you're looking for somebody who's, who's a blasphemer. But if you are looking for the Savior, things are going to be different starting right now. You know, when the Apostle Paul, you know, when Saul began to change, you know, was at the stoning of Stephen. There's no accident that it says in the book of Acts that, 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 that Saul was there and that he was holding the, the robes of the ones that were stoning Stephen to death. It's not an accident that he's named there. Luke was the, Luke was the, was, was the guy that was recording all the, you know, this history of the book of Acts. He spent some time with Paul. And just to see Stephen die in such a wonderful Christian way. 
and started the change. Woman, why are you weeping and whom do you seek? In Matthew chapter 5, and this is going to seem like such a departure from where I am. Just bear with me. When are you going to put a clock in here? Never? Probably never. (laughs) That probably wouldn't be a good thing to do. (laughs) On the other hand, you could have a countdown clock, you know, that goes from 60 minutes to zero and then resets. Chapter number five of, seeing the multi- of Matthew, seeing the multitudes, Jesus went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying. And the next several verses are what are known as the Beatitudes. A Beatitude, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means supreme blessing. The actual word blessed at the beginning of all these following verses, is, and we know this, most of us know this, is could be translated happy, but it's not just it's not just content. It's not just joyeux. It's, 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 a, it's, like, it's, like, a, it's like a supreme happiness. It's, a, it's like, it's like a, a fulfillment. Some people, some people define it as felicity. We don't hear that very much in English anymore. Felicity is a, is a super happiness. Super happy. It's like the ultimate happiness. So it's not just happy. Oh, this is good. Uh, it's, it's like fulfilling happiness. And I want you to notice this. I don't know when I first started noticing this, but see if this makes sense to you because it sure does to me. Verse number three. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And from there on, what we see, what I see is a progression of a Christian life, I see the, mat- the maturation of a Christian who surrenders him or herself to God. And it starts with the first two. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Literally, blessed are the ones that are poor in self. In other words, there is a blessedness. There is a supreme happiness that begins when we realize, when we get the revelation of how we've got nothing to save ourselves by. In myself, I'm poor. I've got nothing to do to, to redeem myself from where I am, from where I've been, and from where I'm going. And even if life is great, when I contemplate life, After death, I've got no answers whatsoever. I can't supply any kind of happiness when it comes to to myself and my, my, my own human destiny. So the whole thing begins with that one revelation that I've got nothing to save myself by. And blessed are those that mourn. Literally, this mourning is the kind of mourning where people have lost a very, very dear hope. And this is why, to me, this, this, the understanding of what I'm trying to, to convey today is, is, so, is so vital at a time, at, at, this, at supposedly the, the, closing, the closing stages of this COVID-19 pandemic. And then who knows what we're headed for after this? I mean, God only knows what's next, you know. But after all of this loss, we need to have some kind of understanding of where we need to come, how we need to come through all this. There is a, there is a fascinating verse. We'll come back here to, to Matthew in just a second. There's a fascinating verse in Romans chapter number 5 speaking about Abraham. Abraham, uh, therefore it's a faith, uh, 17, uh, first, uh, chapter 5, 17. As it is written, I've made you a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. 18, of Abraham, who against hope, against hope, he believed in hope. Who against hope, he believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. Who against hope, 
He believed hope. Same word, both places. Same word that, that, that I'm talking about here in Matthew. Hoping. And when we mourn, it's because we've lost some kind of hope. For Abraham, he, was, who, he, he had a hope in God. He had a hope in what God told him, that he would be, he would be the father of many nations, that from him would come this, 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 this line that traces the path of the coming Messiah. He was, he, the answer to humanity was coming through the loins of Abraham, and yet he had no children. And the hope that he hoped against was the hope of the world. It's the same word. But there's a worldly, carnal, natural hope that just hopes for stuff. Now hope, a Bible hope means a sincere trust and expectation in something that you know is going to come. And don't tell me that the world doesn't hope like that. They do. Most of the time, most of the time, even when we use the word hope, we don't use it in the scriptural sense. Because when we hope something, we have a sure expectation of its arrival. It's almost like saying something, we call it saying something by faith. But it's biblical hope. Biblical hope is a powerful thing. Experience produces hope. Tribulation Patience, experience, hope, and then Paul said, and hope makes, makes you not, it may, never makes you ashamed. It never disappoints you. It never lets you down. When you've walked through this stuff, and now you've got this experience, and you know this thing, and you know what's coming, after all the trials we'll go through, we have this certain concrete hope of where we're going and what we're going to be. Even though we don't see what we're going to be exactly, we know we're going to be whatever it is we're going to be, and we're going to be with Him forever. Abraham hoped against a worldly hope. That's what we've got to compete with. Everybody hopes for all this stuff and it'll just get inside our brain and it'll afflict us. And we'll end up hoping for the similar things that they hope for. But there is a Bible-based hope. And when that hope is seemingly taken from you, you will learn what it means to mourn. The first thing is I've got nothing inside to redeem myself. But I'm starting on this thing. I'm daring to believe against worldly hope and begin to hope in Jesus. And then some of my hopes and expectations are taken away from me. And it causes me to mourn. Yesterday at the close when, when I was babbling on and on and finally got the revelation, you need to sit down and be quiet. I, I, I just used the last few minutes and I, you know, I said, okay, maybe we can have a little Q&A. And so a couple of questions came out. And then Josh Lewis asked me a question. Perfect question. Perfect. I, I, was, I, was, I was touched. I mean, here's this old guy that's teaching. You know, he's been around the block, obviously, a few times. He's emphatic about what he's been teaching. But let me ask you this, Brother Grossbach. What would you say after all of your years and all the things that, you know, you've learned from God? What was, the, what, was the, what was the thing in life that taught you the most? And I just simply said, suffering. One word, and the whole place got really quiet. Suffering. Because, and I didn't even explain it very well. But I'll tell you what, why? Why? When you're mourning, when you're suffering, when you're hoping against hope and suffering in the meantime, you get a really good glimpse of who you are. <laughs> it's like young guys that get in fights. I mean, you know, you, f you find all kinds of people. Back before Christ, when I was young and stupid and reckless as can be, some of that hasn't changed too much. I was working at the Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company in Virginia. 
And uh, after our shift, we all kind of gathered around toolboxes and we're putting stuff up. And then you, you know, then you get dismissed, and and then you all walk out. The thousands of guys going up these steps and then the, finding their cars and driving home. Well, we're at the little shack here where the toolboxes are, and we're putting everything up. And I got into a kind of pushy shovey ma- ma- uh, match with this guy about my age, and. Uh, and I think, you know, in today's language, I think it would have been, you could translate it as I disrespected him in front of the guys because it, at the push and shove, you know, then it got a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then within, don't know, ask me how, but within seconds, I had this guy in a, like a, like a neck crunching headlock, gasping for air, you know, and he's, you know, kind of slapping me like uncle. And I let him go, you know. I thought that was a nice thing to do, you know, before he passes out or whatever. And, uh, but he was totally disrespected in front of his, of his cronies. And so when he gets out and he gets his breath, he looks at me and points at me. He says, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you tonight. He says, I've got a gun in my car. I'll find you. I'm going to kill you when you leave the gate. Wow. And I believed him. I mean, what are you going to do? I had a little pocket knife. <laughs> As I was going up the steps, I reached into my pocket, pulled out my knife, and extended the blade and just held it on to me. And I said, if I see a gun anywhere, I'm going to stab the hand that's got it. <laughs> and I never saw a gun. Sometimes, you know, when you're going to fight, you know, there's, there's a guy that's a really big, he's a big mouth. You know, and, yeah, I can do, you know, I can do that, I can do that, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, what's wrong with you, you know, the bully type. And then when you face this bully down, he's got really nothing. You know, it's kind of like that about, it's like, sometimes you just got to make a stand in life. You got to make a stand in Christian life. You've got to hope against hope. When you've got nothing, at least you know you're on the right path. Look at the progression of this. The first two things, the first two things are poor in spirit. And then the second one is blessed are those that mourn. Blessed are those that mourn. Why? Because they'll be comforted. Not necessarily here and now, not necessarily tomorrow, but they'll be comforted. Now let's grow a little bit. Blessed are the meek. Who's that? That's people that don't resist. People that don't fight. And I don't mean like a shipyard fight. I mean they don't fight against what comes along in life. They don't scratch and claw their way through life getting everything on their own. They are meek. They're now they're beginning to find God because they're poor in spirit. And they've, they've had to go through mourning and learn who they really are. Learn how much fight is really in them or how much fight's not there. How much we're just blowing air when we're talking about how much faith we got. But when push comes to shove, we can't get through this trial. There's people that believe that they can speak things into existence and they take that false faith and they try to pray themselves out of the trial that God put them in. You're praying against God. God, I'm sick. Or God, he's sick. Or God, they're sick. Or God, look at this situation. You can't, this, this has got to change. This is not right. We shouldn't suffer like this. Where did you get that idea? Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we don't necessarily know when or how or why. And then blessed are the meek, the ones that don't scratch it out for themselves. Why? Because eventually they'll inherit the earth if they do it God's way. Growing in grace, growing in the knowledge. Then blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. See, they're growing. They're looking for more. And the more you look, the more you'll find and the more you'll grow. And you keep getting hungry and thirsty and searching and filled. And then blessed are the merciful because they should obtain mercy. What does that mean? Blessed are somebody who finds what mercy is in their life, in their, in their human condition and human's spot where they are in this, in this life. And they extend mercy to somebody else because when they do that, now they know what it means to re- obtain the mercy of God. We, know, we always attack that kind of thing from the, from, in the reverse. We think that we look to God and we learn about all this mercy from Him, but we never extend it to somebody else. What's the real issue here? The real issue is we're not learning it at all. We're not applying it at all. So we can't obtain His mercy. We don't even know what it is. 
You can preach it to me, but if I don't extend it at some point to somebody that needs mercy, if I don't release the, the, the chokehold eventually, blessed are the pure in heart. Man, they're growing. Now there's holiness involved. There's, there's separation. There's, there's, there's focus on who God is only. Blessed are the pure and hot, for those are the ones that will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now they learn, they learn what peace really is. Peace like a river. Peace. It's not just something you say. It's something you have. It's something that just surrounds you. It's something that stabilizes you. See, this guy is growing. This believer is growing. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that you get to number nine, you know, and, and you'll never go back to number one. No, you'll visit all these. But there's a progression here of learning. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But there's another one. Those are the Beatitudes that I memorized as a, as a kid in the Sunday school of the United Presbyterian Church in Indianapolis where I grew up. We had to memorize those in Psalm 23 and the Lord's Prayer. And you do that and you get a Bible with your name on it and you're, you baptize on the forehead with a drop of water and you're in. Man, I, I memorized this stuff. I, I could have quoted it then easily, but I didn't have a clue about what it meant. Beatitudes. Those are the Beatitudes. Where do you find them? Matthew 5. But there's another one. There's another one in Matthew chapter 11 that I want to leave you with. It came to pass when Jesus, chapter, chapter 11, verse number 1, that when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in the cities. And when John, not this John, the, the writer of, of the gospel John, but John the Baptist, now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and, he, and said unto Jesus, here's the message, are you the one that should come or are we looking, should we look for another? I think there's three ways to look at this. Any of them might be the correct one. We'll have to find out when we get to the other side and ask John. The first one is, he's discouraged. He is the messenger of God. He's lived, he lived most of his life in the desert until God gave him the clear sign to come out of the desert and to begin to preach the coming of the Messiah. He had a tremendous ministry. All of Judea turned out to hear, to hear him and to be baptized of him unto repentance. He believed it. His, his birth was miraculous in, in nature. The, the naming of John by his father, Zacharias, was a, was a miracle in itself. I mean, you, know, you may know the story. Just read Luke chapter number 1. It was marvelous. And, and the prophecy about him was, was profound and just, just amazing. He was quite a guy. And never faith. He's the one that baptized Jesus. He's the one that, that, that saw the vision of the dove and heard the voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He's the one who did it despite the threats. He's the one that said uh, that he must increase, speaking of the one that he was prophesying about, and I must decrease. I'm not worthy to latch his sandals or unlatch. I'm not worthy to do anything compared to him. He's the one that had this holy humility and great submission to God and his calling. And it's really, even though I used to think that John may well have been discouraged in the prison, I don't think that much anymore. No, he was too focused. Although it makes sense in some way. I mean, you can justify it in the way that I used to justify it is, is simply that, you know, Jesus' answer is this, go and show John the things that you hear and the things that you see and tell him how I'm raising the dead and healing the blind and healing the deaf and casting out demons and doing all these things. Just kind of remind him that, you know, I'm still doing stuff. You know, and I used to think, that, well, that, that's all fine, but it didn't help John 
Doesn't help him get out of the prison. Sometimes Christians do that to each other. Your mourning, your hope has just been shattered. Things that you had a sure expectation of, that you, you, were, you were hoping against hope for this thing, and then it just falls apart. It doesn't turn out the way you thought. And then people come along and try to encourage you by telling you, well, it'll be all right because it's always all right because God always helps those that help them, and God always heals, and God's always delivering you, and, da, 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 and then the person dies. You know, you don't want to hear about how he raised everybody else from the dead or, or how he healed everybody else's disease when he's not doing something for you. So that would have been kind of hard for... But I don't, I don't think that's the problem with John. The other one is, another one is that um, John knew that his disciples were flagging in their faith. Some of his followers that were still loyal to him, even though almost everybody, John was doing everything he could to turn complete attention to ever, all of his listeners to the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah. He still had his followers, and obviously they were with him and could see him in jail. And they came to him and took the message to Jesus. And it could very well be that John the Baptist simply wanted them to hear from Jesus for themselves, not just from the words of John. So go and ask him if he's the one or if we should look for another. Well, go and tell John, but in essence, go and tell your, you, yourselves that this is all happening. Maybe. The third one is really interesting. The third one is really interesting. It's the juxtaposition thing. John the Baptist... Let me go back to the first thing that I was saying. I mean, his whole life was about this. His whole life was about proclaiming who Jesus was. Now John's arrested, put into prison. He'll soon be beheaded. And the kingdom of God hasn't exactly arrived yet. I I know who he is. I know whom I'm prophesied about. I know who I've preached about. I know who I, who I sought in prayer while I, was in, while I was in the desert. I know what I, what I said was right. I know who I baptized. I know he's the one. I know who he is. He's the one. I know that the Father has, has, look, has bestowed this love upon us that, I could, that we can be called the sons of God. I know that. But it doesn't seem to be happening in the timing as it should. I'm in jail. Jesus, why haven't you established your kingdom on the earth now? Shouldn't you do something now? Go and ask him. And Are you the one? Are you going to do it like I think I knew you were going to? Are you going to do it the way that I kind of knew you were going to do it? Are you going to do this now? Are you going to do this on my terms? Are you going to do it like I thought it was supposed to happen? Well... Go back and tell John that I'm doing this, and I'm doing that, and I'm doing this. And then the greatest of all the Beatitudes, he tells John, Blessed is he that's not offended in me. He's not offended in the way that I do things, which are always the perfect way to do things. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what kind of loss you've suffered. I know you've suffered something. I know I've suffered. My wife has suffered something. The last time we were here was for a memorial for our son. It's not on his death certificate, but I'm sure that COVID had a part to play in this in this broken down heart. And just wore him out quick. He was working in a health facility. He was working in a, in a nursing home. That's not exactly how we thought.
It's like, it's like we have to ask him. It's like we're asking him, is this you? I'm called a son of God. I'm one. So is this the way it works? <laughs> the human condition is always right there. Are you the one? Yes, I'm the one. I'm the one, Jesus answers back. I'm the one. And this is what it brings. Knowing me means this. Here's the path. Now, can you walk it? One day we'll see him as he is because we'll be like him. Now, Paul said, we see through a glass darkly and then face to face. Praise God. So I don't know what, what you've lost. I don't know how you've suffered. But in that suffering, you find out more of who you are than ever before. I'm still here. You're still here. He's still there. We're still going there. The whole future is right in front of us. No matter what it brings, He's done great things. And we'll bless His holy name. He's done great things. And we will bless His holy name. Bless His holy name and His will, and His purpose, and His being, and His promises. Every tender time, every tough time, every far away experience, every close up experience, Jesus is right there. You're right, Sister Grossbach, He's always right there. We've tested that to the limits. We've tried to take him to places that he probably didn't want to go sometimes himself. He's always right there. Go to Baku Mulumba. He's right there underneath the water tower. I just know exactly where I found him in Baku Mulumba. Dibaya Lubwe. Oh, man, I know where that is. And he's there. Go into a, bunch of, a den of a bunch of devils in some far-flung village. Everybody's thinking the worst and look who shows up. Jesus of Nazareth. My everlasting hope. Will you stand? Will you bless his name forever? Will you thank him with your whole heart? Will you confess that you don't understand and that it's true? I, I, don't, I can't figure it all out, God. And even silently, sometimes, Lord, I ask, without even saying it, because I don't dare to say it, but silently, Lord, even in the most secret of places in my thoughts, sometimes, Lord, I may say, are you really the one? And then I hear your tender voice say, yes, I'm the one. And this is the path. Just walk in it. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, we love you more than anything. God, you have shown us in our broken times how precious you really are. You've shown us over and over that without you, Lord God, we can do nothing. And we can't save ourselves, oh God, help us. Intercede, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. In the name of the one God who gave himself for us. And Thank you, Lord God, for your sacrifice. Like your great apostle wrote, Lord, thank you for your unspeakable gift. Oh, God, touch this congregation, I pray. Touch every broken spirit here, Lord. Touch every heart. Help us to, be, to have courage to open our hearts up unto you like never before. And let your grace come in and change our lives forever. Oh, God. We'll go anywhere that you ask us to go, Lord. 
We'll pay any price, Lord, because we want to be with you and see you like you really are. Oh, God, of the heavens and of the earth, oh, God, take us, Lord, and embrace us right now. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Just wait. Wait on the Lord here. Let God speak to someone's heart in a new and fresh way. Come unto me, all ye that labor, all that are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for your souls. Oh, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. I love you, God. Thank you for your wonderful gift. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your word that lasts forever, oh God. Thank you for your kingdom. Thank you for your promises. Oh, God, thank you for the fellowship of your spirit. Thank you for changing me. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Hallelujah. If you're here today and you're comfortable with this idea and you, you really want somebody to pray with you, pl you, please, you can come down to the front and we'll pray with you as long as you want us to pray. We want you to know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Thank you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, our lives down here are like a vapor. They're like morning dew, Jesus, on the grass that's there. And then in the heat of the sun disappears. We're here for a few days, oh God. And then we go on for eternity. Jesus, help us know you, Lord. Help us extend our hands, God, to you. Why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? Are you weeping because you've lost something? Or are you weeping because there's a comforter? In the midst of our mourning, there's a comforter. I'm weeping for joy. Mary could have said, I'm weeping for joy. Because he's gone, he's not in the tomb anymore, so I know he's fulfilling his promise for me. But she, all she saw was the loss right here and now. Why are you weeping? Are you weeping for sorrow? Or are you weeping with peace? Are you weeping because you're lost? Or are you weeping because you're found?
Lord. I'm weeping because I'm found, Lord. I'm weeping because I'm found. Mary's, Mary's hope was, Mary's hope was she'd find him in the tomb. Because then she could anoint his body with the oils and the balms, that, the spices that she had bought. The best thing that I could do, Mary thought, is to, is to anoint his dead body and show how much I care. And now his body's gone and I can't do what I know I should do. And yet, and yet there was a whole lot more. Why are you weeping? The angel said, why are you weeping? Jesus said, why are you weeping? What are you looking for? Are you weeping because of doubt? Or are you weeping because of certainty? Lord, I don't know a lot, but I know this. Tell him, Lord, I don't know a lot, but I know this. I know who you are. God can change. God can change you. God can change you. God can do anything. He can do anything. But He won't fail. And He won't do the wrong thing. He'll always do the right thing. It may not go like you think it ought to go. But He'll always do the right thing. That much I know, God. passage in John 20 it doesn't it doesn't say these words but we know these words are there when Jesus when Mary realizes who she's speaking to that it is in fact Jesus Jesus the next thing that he tells her is don't touch me now I've not yet ascended unto my father That doesn't mean that he's in some kind of state that can be polluted by a human touch. It doesn't mean, don't touch me because you'll be electrocuted with the power of... uh -uh. What it's it's saying without saying is that when she has found out who he is, that he's not the gardener around the tombs, that it's Jesus. She She must have grabbed a hold of his feet. She must have fallen to her knees and grabbed a hold of his feet as if to say, I'll never let you go. And Jesus had to say, don't touch me now because there's much more to come. Let me finish. Let me finish what I'm doing for you. And then one day, Mary... He'll be with me forever. Juxtaposition at Calvary. Two thieves, one on each side of the Savior, crucified on the same day in the same way, at the same time. One lost. One of them suddenly repents in his agony and in his loss and in his imminent death. And Jesus turns to him. Here's this thief. He's got nothing. He doesn't deserve anything. Hasn't earned anything of value in his life. And Jesus turns to him and says, (laughs) Juxtaposition. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Today you'll be with me in paradise. 
Some of the ones that we've lost over this last year have heard those very words. Sean, today, <coughs> you'll be with me in paradise. John, been a lot of suffering for a lot of years, a lot of loss, a lot of loss. A disease that, that so incapacitates the human condition that loved ones aren't even known anymore sometimes. But today, and we go to the funeral. And we weep, because that's what we do. But if you listen real closely, there's a voice. Why are you weeping? So how did you grow, Brother Grossbaugh? How do you grow? You suffer the human condition and juxtapose it with the truth that endures forever. I know you. And it'll be all right. It'll be all right.